Hello and welcome back to the KCC channel. I'm Rob and I hope you are having a wonderful day today. Today, we're jumping into some malicious compliance. Before we start, if you're new here, make sure to hit that subscribe button. It's completely free and you can always change your mind later. But if you stick around, there just might be some tasty cake in your near future. <laughs> Bet you thought I was going to say cookies, right? All right, our first story today comes to us from Epic Sausage 69. Only do what is in my job title? Fine. Good luck paying employees. Let's jump right in. So, I work for a construction company as an inventory admin. My job is to basically schedule counts of our warehouse and input the numbers they give me for inventory. Then, try to see what the problem is when the numbers on the last count and the current count don't add up. There is a little bit more to it, but I will not bore you with the specifics. The problem with this job is that when you have been doing it long enough and are good at it, there is less work to do. In the beginning, when counting one rack out of 60 racks of material would take a few days, it was fine because I was always busy. But now that everything is in order, the entire warehouse can be counted in three days. This leaves me bored for most of the time. So, to fix this, I studied up on our cloud-based ERP service that we use for all internal and external transactions, and have become sort of an expert on it. Every single aspect of this company uses this ERP service to do their job. Timesheets, HR, payroll, accounting, scheduling, management, manufacturing, ordering from vendors, delivering, inventory, etc. All runs through this ERP service. So, it's very important that this service is up and running perfectly 24-7. I became so proficient in this service that our VP decided to cut ties with our consultants of the ERP because I could do what they did, but better, quicker, and much cheaper. For reference, we were paying these consultants $5,000 a month just to be on standby if we needed them for some sort of problem that could arise from using this ERP and had to dish out more money to fix those problems depending on how many hours of their time was spent to fix said problems. Not sure on their exact rate, but it was something like $200 an hour and they took weeks to fix anything. Well, I could fix the problem in time for my daily afternoon crap break. I never got an official job title or raise of any kind for being an expert on this service. The company just saw me being able to do it and let me fix things that happened so they no longer needed the outside help. I wasn't too upset because it gave me something to do, so I was glad to help the company save money, even if none of that money fell my way. Skip ahead a few months, we now have a new warehouse manager and someone in the warehouse F something up in inventory by sending a bunch of materials to the wrong job with no records of it being shipped. We are talking half a million dollar F up here. In the same day, our ERP had an update that caused a bunch of bugs with our accounting department. So, I decided to work on the ERP problem first because the warehouse's F-up is more of a delay F-up and not actually stopping anybody from doing their job at the moment, while this accounting problem means our bills are not able to be paid. You can guess what kind of issues we will have if bills are not paid. The ERP bug turns out to be quite big and numerous so it ends up taking me a couple days to figure it out, but I fix it before any bills are actually due, and decide to take lunch a little early to celebrate a victory. Crisis averted. New warehouse manager storms into my office after I get back from lunch and is livid. Apparently, the bosses were pinning the blame on him for the warehouse F up, and considering he is the one who oversees shipments and personnel in the warehouse, the blame is rightfully placed. He starts laying into me, asking why I have not fixed the problem yet, yelling and screaming like a child. I tried explaining that I was fixing an ERP issue and have not had time to look at the warehouse problem yet. He gets even more angry and notes that it is funny how I have time to take early lunches, but not do my job. That started to piss me off, but I held my tongue and kept calm about the situation. He then ordered me to only do what is in my job title and to leave the ERP BS to the people competent enough to handle it, as he put it. Since this guy was technically my supervisor, I had no choice but to obey. I asked him to send me that in writing and he snarks and storms back into his office. 
five minutes later, I get an email stating that under no circumstances am I to work on anything related to ERP unless it involves inventory. Q malicious compliance. I do nothing but inventory from that point forward, knowing darn well that we would be essentially coasting until we hit a problem that I would refuse to fix. Sure enough, not even a week later, I get an email from HR that some sort of bug in the ERP system was preventing them from accessing payroll to pay employees this week. I reply an apology that I'm no longer able to work on ERP bugs due to supervisor and refer to the ERP system help guide for further assistance. I know the help guide was not going to help her in the slightest, but it was no longer my problem, so I was not going to deal with it. Skip a few days later to Friday, I checked my bank account in the morning before getting to work and laughed because there was no money deposited. That problem never got fixed. I hurry up and get to work, excited to see the chaos unfold. And what I was expecting was an understatement. When I show up to work, I see the entire warehouse staff of 50 people walking out of the front door. I stopped one and asked why they're leaving, and they reply with, I didn't get paid today, so I'm not coming back until I do. I go into the office and see the warehouse manager in a panic. He has jobs that need material and nobody to load it onto trucks or deliver. I ask him if he needs help with anything, and he just screams at me to leave his office because he's getting phone calls out the butt from superintendents of jobs asking why our material has not arrived yet. I pass by HR on the way to my office and see a bunch of the bosses huddled up over her computer with angry and confused expressions on their faces, I guess trying to figure out the problem. I felt bad for her because it really was something out of her control but I knew she would ultimately be okay because she had been there for so long that they would never fire her. When I get to my office, I see the VP waiting for me there. He has a very pissed off expression on his face. When we get inside, he demands to know why I did not fix the problem in HR when she emailed me about it. I replied that I am no longer allowed to work on ERP problems as it is not in my job title. He has the most shocked look on his face and asked why all of a sudden I had a change of heart. I show him the email from the warehouse manager, and I could see the dots connect in his head. He immediately storms out, and I see him heading straight to the warehouse manager's office. They were in there for a few hours, but eventually, he comes back to my office. He seems calmer now, and asks me politely if I can fix the problem in HR, and if I can resume fixing the ERP if needed. At this point, I liked the relief of responsibility and told him I would only do it if he put it officially in my job title along with a raise. His calmness turned to anger again and he says I cannot believe you as he storms out and returns to his office. A few hours later, he sends out a mass email that he has hired the old ERP consultants to fix the problem and that next week everyone would be paid for the money they are owed along with the money they earned if they returned to work. This one surprised me, as he would rather pay over $60,000 a year to consultants than give me a few extra bucks an hour for better work. I think he expected me to change my mind and just do it for my own paycheck, but I decided to wait because I knew how these consultants were, and if they managed to fix this problem in a week, I would streak naked through the office. Most of the warehouse staff agreed to return, but were still upset about not getting paid. Sure enough, next Friday comes around. Nobody gets paid again. At this point, it is becoming a real problem, and the entire staff is becoming agitated. They have bills to pay. I even heard a bunch of the warehouse talking about some competitors nearby they could go to for work. At this point, I even considered just fixing the problem because the warehouse didn't deserve to be treated like that due to poor management. Maybe I am the butthole here for this, but I am severely underpaid and can barely afford my apartment. There is no reason I should do extra work for free. That same day, the VP returns to my office and hands me papers. These papers said that I would be promoted to a newly created position that dealt with inventory and ERP upkeep. It would be its own department and he would be my direct supervisor. Also came with a hefty raise. All I had to do was sign and agree. 
I looked up at him after reading the paper, and he had the saddest look on his face. Please just sign it. The consultant said it would take them weeks to get around to fixing it due to the high volume of clients they have taken on, and we cannot keep skipping paychecks. I happily signed it and immediately got to work on the HR issue. Managed to even fix it that same day. It was just a simple problem with the permissions of HR and payroll in the ERP due to the update. Now, down in the comment section for this one, OP was told that they should probably look into working for the ERP consultants because they probably pay a lot better considering what they're charging. Now, OP said that they've definitely been looking into that but they might become a consultant themselves independently when the company they're working for crashes and burns. I think the biggest lesson we can take away from this story though, is that when one of your supervisors tells you to do something sketchy that you know is going to hurt the company in the long run, yeah, make sure you get that in writing. Cover your butt. That's the only way you're going to come out on top in the end. Our next story today comes to us from Albino Raven 666 Customer asked me to count out a bag of live crickets in front of her, loses out on bonus crickets. Let's jump right in. I, 32 female, work part-time at a pet store to supplement my income as my salary of a full-time teacher doesn't always pay the bills. Plus, I have a few pets and 20% off in-store purchases is rather helpful. Anyway, one of the things we supply are live and frozen feeder animals for things like reptiles, certain aquatic creatures, and invertebrates. These include things like mice, rats, dubia roaches, bloodworms, mealworms, waxworms, superworms, and crickets. The mice and rats are either frozen or live, but either way, they're easy to count and box up for the customer. Dubia roaches, mealworms, waxworms, and superworms are pre-packaged and price marked, but the crickets are not. Crickets are kept in these large containers with a mesh top, egg cartons for the crickets to climb and hide in, cricket food, and hydration. This means when customers ask for crickets, which we usually sell by the dozen, we have to count and retrieve them manually while putting them in a plastic bag we then fill with air and tie off to go with the customer. Our method for transferring the crickets is to lightly tap the egg cartons over a funnel-like object that doesn't have a hole at the bottom. We tap the crickets in, wrap the plastic bag around the mouth of the funnel, then tip it and lightly tap the crickets into the bag. Some crickets jump in out of order or cling to others, so often customers are given bonus crickets, which we're okay with. It's better than shorting them. So customers are always given the right amount or often more than what they asked for without an increase in price. Most people get this. The customer in this story did not. A woman comes in and she asked for four dozen crickets, 48 crickets total. I went to the back, tapped the crickets from the cartons into the funnel, and then counted them into the bag. As per usual, the occasional extra cricket tumbled or hopped in, probably putting the total to be a bit over 50 by the time I was done. I bagged them, tied the bag, then took them to the counter. Now, I don't know if this woman was having a bad day or if she had been stiffed by another store in the past, but she demanded that we count out the crickets in front of her before she pay for them. I explained that it was likely she got more than what she asked for and counting out 48 crickets individually would take a little while. She insisted she wanted to be sure we weren't ripping her off. So I got one of those small plastic critter keepers and a pair of tongs. I opened the bag making it deflate and slightly more painful to work with and inserted the tongs. Delicately so not to crush the crickets, I grabbed each one with the tongs and started counting slowly so not to crush the crickets with the tongs or lose my place while counting, something I do struggle with, and dropped each individually counted cricket into the critter keeper. So after about 5-10 to 10 minutes at the counter, meticulously counting crickets with tongs, and maybe deliberately taking a little bit longer than I had to out of spite, a line was building up behind the woman, and I was getting close to the end of my count. Eventually, I hit the grand total of what she paid for, 48 crickets. And wouldn't you believe it, there were 10 left over in the bag. Almost a whole extra free dozen she would have gotten had she not asked me to count. I said, oh, would you look at that? My mistake. You were right. I did miscount. I'll put these other ones back and ring you up for the 48. I'll be right back. And before she could protest, I wandered off to dump the last 10 crickets back into the cricket container. 
When I came back to check her out, she was silent, not looking at me. Did her best to ignore the irritated looks of the customers lining up behind her while I poured her 48 crickets back into a plastic bag. She paid, then slunk off sheepishly out the door without a thank you or a glance back. I then got through the rest of the line quickly and apologized to the customers in line for the wait. I sent them home with some free samples, thanked them for their patience, then continued along with my shift. She never complained, and she did return to the location several times after. She never asked anyone to count crickets again. Now, OP added a couple of edits on at the bottom. It says, edit. Wow. So this kind of blew up. Uh, just a couple of things I want to respond to, common questions and statements, etc. One, people keep saying they've read this before. You may have read similar stories. If you look at some of the older comments in this thread, you'll see links to different stories with similar themes. A cricket story from two years ago. There's a feeder fish one. And one about a guy who sold mini samosas. There's also a lot of people in the comments who have worked similar situations sharing their stories. So while the situation in which this happened may not be unique, this is an original story I wrote yesterday based on a real experience I had at the pet store I work at. Two, yes, I get paid horribly as an educator and that sucks, but I do love my teaching career. I enjoy working with students and seeing them grow and develop into the adults they will become. It's an honor to nurture and feed that development. But yes, we are underpaid and underappreciated. Thank you to those sympathizing. What a world we live in when the people that educate our children and get them set up for the big bad world after school have to take on second jobs because we don't pay them enough to do that. That is a load of BS. Getting back to the crickets, OP said in another comment that they're about 95 cents per dozen after tax. Let's even say hypothetically that somebody gets shorted one or two out of however many they bought. They could probably pick up more change on their way back out to their car from the ground than it would cost to get those two extra crickets. I just don't understand some people. Our next story today comes to us from Shabuti. Working during my planned vacation, then have to pay me extra when I leave. Let's jump right in. I'd been working at this company for about three years. I had been consistently growing in my role and eventually was given a project to own, with one to two other team members if needed. But it was a major project with a quick turnaround. I determined I could do it myself, though it would be tight, and since I was hoping for a promotion, I took on the project solo. I was able to deliver the project slightly ahead of schedule and with better quality than expected, which allowed us to make a huge sale. The head of the company gave me an award at an all-hands meeting for the work I did, and my boss let me know I was on track for an end-of-year promotion, with a nice pay raise and more responsibilities. But I was needed in another part of the business, so I was going to have to transfer under a new manager that was notoriously hard to work with. I transferred to this manager, and the first meeting we had to get on the same page, I brought up that I had a three-week planned vacation in four months. I had never taken vacation, so had six weeks saved up and did not want to start losing it. He told me, of course, that would be fine, and we would be able to make it work. About a week later, we have our first meeting with our product team. They had a new, large product idea and wanted it to be released in just three months. As my team looked over the details, we knew this was a six to eight month project at best, and it would be better to deliver it in smaller increments so they still had something to show in three months, or we would need to push out the schedule. My boss was adamantly against both, so throughout the next week, he made us have last minute three to four hour brainstorming sessions every day, but he would not even tell us until around 3 p.m., forcing all of us to work late every day that week. At the end of the week, there was no way we could figure out to deliver everything on the shorter timeline. And so my boss asked me to stay behind after the meeting. For another hour, he railed against me saying I was failing at this project and that he could not see me getting a good annual review in four months and that a promotion wasn't even on the table. This annual review would also include the project I had just received an award for and is supposed to encompass 12 months of work. But he was basing this off of the first two weeks on this new team. At this point, I knew he was ready to use me as a scapegoat for his bad management, 
and started applying elsewhere. We continued working on the project and sure enough, at the end of three months, we were still far from being able to deliver and my boss was getting heat from up above. Right around this time, I received an offer from another company that would be the promotion I wanted and an even larger pay increase. I accepted the offer and negotiated my start date to be after my vacation, now three weeks away. That same day, my boss calls me into his office and tells me, we need to talk about this vacation. I reminded him that we had talked about it months before and that everything is booked, flights, hotels, etc. He would not let up and told me there was no way I could take three weeks off with how behind schedule we are. He told me I could go on my trip, but I could not take vacation and would be expected to be online during our business hours throughout the trip, 4 a.m. to 1 p.m. local time in my vacation spot. Q malicious compliance. Every morning while on vacation, I would log on at 4 a.m., check emails, answer questions on our internal chat, and do the minimum work expected, logging off as soon as it hit 1 p.m., all without burning any vacation. With one week left in vacation, I requested a conference call with my boss to give him my two weeks notice. He was shocked and tried everything to get me to stay and finish out the project, including bringing back up a possible promotion. I told him I had already accepted a job with a start date upcoming. I worked my last two weeks before moving on to my new job. Because my boss required me not to take vacation, the company had to pay out all of my accrued vacation once I left, a little less than seven weeks at this point, including the three weeks I had originally planned to take. Now short-staffed, I hear from other coworkers that the project missed two more adjusted deadlines and eventually the manager was demoted before being let go from the company. About six months later, the head of the first company asked me to lunch to offer me a role taking over my former boss's old position. I negotiated an even higher pay increase, as well as company equity, and ended up going back there for three more years. Okay, this story just kept giving and giving and giving. OP was an absolute genius in how they just shoved this back on the company. I mean, they got to sit on a beach having quote-unquote vacation while still getting fully paid for it, and then when they went back, they got a vacation time accrual payout? Oh, that was just beautiful. Check out all three OPs linked in the description down below. I thank you for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day, and we'll see you tomorrow.